So I sent you a video that says people think our universe, um, perspective-wise, thinks that we're in one place at the planet's orbiting around the sun. Right. Um, but their argument was that actually we're moving through space, and so they had, like, the sun moving forward and then all the planets kind of going in this, wrapping around it as it mo keeps moving up and up and right. wherever it's, or up, or over, left, right, I don't know. And you said, depending on what perspective you decide to imaginatively watch from, I would call this misleading, not because it's not true, but because it claims a correct objective perspective without justifying it. If you said, if you were standing in the Milky Way, then this is what you'd see. Mm. Then you'd be honest. Okay, fair enough. That's a good point. Fair. Because, that's a good because, point. Because they're picking a place to be the place that's not moving. Which is really odd to this really odd. Wow. How do you? Whoa. Well, that kind of hits on everything we're talking about, doesn't it? That's trying to stand outside of yourself to. Yeah, and I, and the thing is, is you know, in in, in a universe like ours where everything is moving in relation to everything, so. The question, so to, to say, here's the place that I am going to say is not moving, right? Here's the center and we'll stand, this will be the spot we watch from. There's not a problem with that. As long as you realize you're picking your, your it's, um, there are all sorts of theological assumptions embedded in what you pick to be the center. Well, it, it, well, and that's huge. That's not anything to be taken lightly. The other it's thing not, that- yeah. The other thing that I thought about, well, because that's that's God mode, right? Like that you at that point, you're right. right. And it's one thing to say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to pick this spot as the center because you got to pick somewhere. And from this point, this would be the thing that you would see. There's, no, there's not a problem with that. We we have to pick something, but it's but, a matter of saying here is what I'm picking and why. But then that that would still have to be moving, too, though. Well, that's that's what I mean. Is they're saying if we were to pick a spot to be the center that everything is moving around, right? Here is the spot that we're going to say is not moving, or I'm going to be able to stand right here and not move. That's yeah. that's what you're doing. Um, and if you know you're doing that, you know, um, then the then that's fine. You know, just uh, it's it's the the this was the early arguments about is the earth the center is the sun the center the early you know uh, milton discusses it in paradise lost they they know it's uh because so they're they're not concerned early on they're not concerned to say well the sun is the center rather than the earth um because they say well yeah i mean you got to pick a center if you're going to pick the sun the math is easier but we've picked the earth as the center for theological reasons and for beauty reasons, right? So to, to say mm. the math is simpler from there is not an argument that it is therefore the center, right? It's It might be an argument that it's a good place to pick as the center because the math is easier, um, th but th you're making a, a an argument based on, um, you know, if you're, you're making an argument that future mathematicians might appreciate futurist future astronomers might appreciate but you're making a to, to say you're saying that's the center and everything moves around it um is a uh and everybody is wrong for picking something else as the center is the thing that early on people objected to um before there was really a shift in the cosmological understanding um that said no simpler is you know, a, a simpler more practical decision is the right decision there's not a there there's not a problem with picking the sun as the thing that we're going to do the that's the point we're going to do math from yeah i'm gonna that's try different it. Than, than saying this is the center that's the center um and mm. everybody else everybody that picks the a different place is wrong I gotta get my door. I think I can. The heater's making noise. Mine was too. I had to shut it up. I was trying to find this um, video 
so I can show it. Oh, there it goes. I might have it here. Man, how, <clears throat> you know, I don't, do they teach you, what is it, astrology? Astronomy? Astronomy. Do they teach you stuff in seminary? Did, in your seminary, do they teach this? Um, no. So when I started to take, study in the liberal arts and realized, well, so really it started about the fifth grade. I get, when Halley's Comet came past, I got really into astronomy and started studying everything I could and ended up, you know, getting a telescope and, and just, uh, studying it. And my first declared major was astrophysics, but then I realized that calculus was not very much fun. And so I just switched over to music, um, and then, uh, couldn't do ear training because I was a drummer and uh, didn't grow up in church singing. So I was a brand new Christian, just starting to learn to sing and, and I couldn't pass ear training. So then I switched to history. Um, and then it ended up history philosophy. So, so I've just been studying. And so, but I taught, I taught classical astronomy for a couple of years. Um, I found because it. it. It's a part of the, it's a part of the, it's a part of a liberal education, a liberal, uh, a free man's education is, is astronomy. There's so much there. Okay, so I found this video. I want to pull it up. I okay. want everybody to see it. So you can see it, right? Here it goes. Yep. So the word actually is the problem that I have a problem with because that's an embedded argument. Say that again. The word actually how where it, it says actually how it works. actually works, right? That's that's where I that's my logical complaint because it's not because uh, this is this is actually true in the sense that if if you were able to stand in the position that this is from, this is what you would see. It be moving slower because they're speeding everything up, but right to make it look cool. Because, it but cool. it's already, it's yeah. already cool though. That's the thing. About it's it. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're adding, they're adding the lines after it. So you can to, track along with it. So you can track it. Right. So, um, and it is, it's gorgeous, right? Yeah. The, I, um, that's where, that's where we, we don't disagree that it's gorgeous. There's an embedded cosmology in the word actually that, is is a particular they're they're unknowingly probably taking a philosophical position um that's unjust that's that's not justified it i mean it might be justifiable but they're not making an argument they're just saying this is how it is and this is how you, it is you take it this like is, that. this is what an objective perspective on the universe is we don't have an objective perspective we have a a phenomenological experience, right? We experience the universe from a particular place in a, at a particular time. And then there, but they're trying to say, but there's this objective perspective that with your imagination, you can put yourself into that objective perspective and that's real. Our phenomenological experience of the universe from the position where we are is not real. I mean, I always start off my astronomy classes with everybody close your eyes and picture the world. Mm. When you picture the world, everybody pictures it from space. I'm picturing that Dr. Pepper you just opened. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lime bubbly. Oh, okay. It's too much sugar in a Dr. Pepper. Although Dr. Pepper is the greatest of all colas. So we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> all right. So I'm picturing... Right. You picture when you say when I say picture the world, we picture the globe from the perspective. I'm doing of space. it right now. Yep. I remember yeah, we talked about we this. Do. And and there's that's that's fine. It's just not actually. An, I mean, I think there's like, you know, 20 some people that have actually seen the world from that perspective. Right. We talked about that's him. Not, that. Yeah. So um, whereas it, it devalues our actual experience of the universe. Whereas, so classical astronomy, 
the reason that I like it and have taught it and, and push for it is that it, it's all astronomy from the perspective of a person standing on the earth, right? So all the astronomy, um, is, is a, astronomy that you can actually go out and experience, right? The as, daytime astronomy and nighttime astronomy, it's all of the stuff that, um, you actually experience. And so it has a way of putting your feet on the ground and pulling your imagination into your own body. Mm. Right. And, and that's, wow. It's like a Gnosticism it killer. Yeah, it is. And I think it, so that's why, that's why I love it. I mean, I, he, you can have an education, you can be educated without it. Um, but it's not a free man. I mean, it's, it's not a, you're, it, there's a, an important aspect to studying astronomy that makes you free to it, it frees your imagination to it gives you i could say it, give, it gives you control over your imagination in a way that a lot of things don't this is it's similar to latin in this way is that it's actually imagination training where you learn to move your imagination around and see the world from different perspectives. Can you, can um, you, can you take something that is currently a problem that having biblical astronomy along with imagination would fix? Well, I mean, so when, when you have, um, should, should I, should I throw out communism or should I throw out like, what, yeah. What? So I, I think a, a good example would be, um, you know, you, when you have, uh, when, when you have something like the, the, I mean, that's a really tough question. Yeah. I think of those. Yeah. I'm really good at that. Ask me a different one and let that one simmer for a second and then I'll come back to it because <clears throat> I know there are some. So, um, I, well, then let me work through this a little bit because I want to talk about when you said astronomy, understanding astronomy makes you a free man. Those, those are the kind of things that, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I'm black and have dealt with the slavery and stuff in America for a while. Yeah. And since my, since being born, and it's just kind of part of American history, and I'm always, I didn't grow up in a particular black context in the beginning of my life. The the At about 10, more traditional black context, I grew up, I would start growing up from 10 on. So up until about 10, missionary's kid, when my parents got a divorce from that age, I went right into the middle of the ghetto and had to learn hard knocks life for real. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> so it, my whole world changed. So I have these two different perspectives, but always dealing with freedom. Um, it seems that we could you that because I'm always thinking about that when COVID hit, I thought about, man, people don't know what's coming. They don't have a concept of what freedom is and they don't have a concept of what tyranny is and they trust their police way too much, you know, to be on their side if they had to choose. And that was evident for me. Like I knew the police were never gonna choose my side. And very, very few sheriffs did. I was, and with the ones that did, I was behind them. But because right. of that, I think everybody is questioning now, what is real freedom? What is free speech? Twitter's all about free speech right now because, uh, well, it has been. People begin been shut down. They can't speak freely. The FBI is controlling speech on, on Twitter. Um, so freedom, yeah. Yeah, we, a, we learned, we learned some things that we, we that a lot of people suspected. Yeah. Know? Yeah. We, but then exactly. all of a sudden you're like, Oh, there's receipts. There's, yes. there's, there's the receipts for but, the, uh, but somebody, some people think just because things have been revealed that we know that we've all of a sudden recovered the thing that's lost and we haven't, we've just been made aware that one group has been in control of it. And so right. we don't we don't have a good concept of freedom. So how does astronomy help develop the reality of freedom um, from understanding it or knowing it? Well, I think what it, it does a number of things. It gives you the ability to recover y your sense of place, right? That that I have a particular spot, a particular place, and that the world the the world is rotating and the world is moving and the stars are moving up above my head and all you know that but um but when you when you see the the rhythms and the patterns you realize that 
you have a spot in that in the in the constantly moving rhythms of things um and uh it it helps you realize some of the it it helps it does have a way of sorting some of the things that are important versus the things that are not important you know um i i think this there's this like bounce in christian nationalism and a lot of people think this is the this is the question of the ages you know right now we have we have to solve this right now this is the question of the ages but they thought that about the last thing too and they thought that about the thing before that right and um this because we don't have a sense of time and place uh, that say okay I, I remember um my dad at one point saying um if a doctrine is less than he so my dad um you know, he, he became a Christian a little bit later in life, but was be, he, he jumped in with both feet, um, went doctrinally in his forties, um, you know, early forties. And, uh, the, I remember him saying, I'm, I'm realizing that if a, if a doctrine is less than 500 years old, I'm very wary mm. of it, mm -hmm. right. That the, that, um, the, the, all that that history has a sifting effect um on what is what is good and true and beautiful and essential and, and what yeah. yeah and essential yeah and so there are things that pop up and and they feel like this is the thing that's the end of the world in the moment um but when you have when you remember uh the way things move through time and the way that god has uh ordained the universe to to move through time and through periods of maturity and immaturity and death and resurrection. And, um, that some of those things that feel like they're the end of the world at the moment turn out to be not the end of the world. And you can sort through those things, um, and say, well, if this, if this is important, it'll last, right. We can have the discussion mm. and fall on different sides and not, um, uh, destroy one another in the process because you know, we're all growing and changing constantly. Right. So um, the, the version of me from my early twenties and the version of me now are significantly different, but they're the same person. And um, because of the major growth and changes that I've seen in myself, I can expect it to happen in other people. Um, and I could be patient mm. and because the world keeps, rolling time keeps moving and there's literally nothing that we can do about it right art so astronomy has a a smalling effect on our self-importance and on our selfhood and that's really good for us right a humbling effect um you know you you read it ancient astronomers they all knew how big the universe was they knew how far away stars were they weren't um they weren't uh, looking in, you know, the, some of the, a lot of the greatest astronomers were from Africa, uh, in the 100 to 700 years. Uh, you had these, this, these great mathematicians, incredible astronomers during that time period. And, um, when you see the way that they were able to, um, track and predict and understand things be, over the course of multiple generations passing down knowledge, um, it, it you realize how little we each personally know <laughs> yeah. about the, yeah. about this place, right? So it has a small, a, a, a humbling effect that's really good for us. Um, and then uh, it has a way of teaching us to that, that this, the, that the Holy spirit is the guide of time right? The world is the world, just the, the universe keeps, um, just keeps on through its liturgies, whether we get things right or get things wrong, or, you know, when, when people die and, and other people are born, you know, the world just sort of keeps moving on through its liturgies because it knows what it's doing. The creation knows its, knows its job, knows its purpose and is 
motivated to love the Lord and continue worshiping him. And so the stars keep moving and the sun keeps coming up. And, uh, and we are the ones that are constantly throwing a, throwing a, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you see this whole debate about whether or not you should have church on Christmas because it falls on a Sunday. And you think, why are we throwing a stick in our own spokes? Right. The, we, we have, we've looked up at the stars and seen that the calendar isn't, doesn't, isn't derived from us or it, it, I mean, it's not, we're, we are, we're now in charge of it because of the new covenant, but we should have learned the wisdom of the, the authorities of the calendar of the first 4,000 years. You just meet every week. That's what you do. Every time Sunday comes around, you have church no matter what. And, um, the, it, there's a freedom to it that says, well, what it's, it's what we do. It's the, we're, we have the role in the new Testament. We are seated in the heavenly places. We're the ones that have the role of the stars. It's our job to mark out time and we mark it out by gathering into God's presence every week, right? That's the fundamental way time is marked out. And so when we say, oh, we're not going to have church, we're, we're saying, I, I'm giving up my the role God has given me. You know, somebody else will take it. There's somebody that's happy to come along and take well, it. Well, I think that what okay, so just to play devil's advocate, I've heard people argue, well, because it isn't a form of legalism, um, it's okay for us to miss this time. We'll be back there next week. It's not a big deal. Um and and I would even if somebody who's listening says, well, since we have so much freedom over our calendars, uh, then we have the freedom to be able to say, nah, we're not going to do it and enjoy this lovely Christmas time with our families. <laughs> oh, well, you, well, I've never heard you chuckle like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, that. That it's it's like it, it, it it's like a college student that you know he turns twenty one, and he says, I have the freedom to use alcohol. Well, he shotguns. Natty Ice, mm. you're like, you have the the you have the freedom to be an idiot. I mean, Smirnoff, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, He's drinking cheerleader beer and right, and um, and you you think what what why what about that is attractive at all, right? It's like saying you know I have. I have the a, a woman saying, well, I have the freedom to wear makeup. And so every morning she puts on a clown face. You like, you, what, 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 why are you doing that? I don't understand. Why are you because, making this personal right now? <laughs> you don't have to hit him. Like I, I mean, but that's, I, I, I just, it's so, it's, it's so fundamentally foolish and against, um, against all the wisdom of, of the ages, that that it, I, I can't even I can't wrap my head around that argument at all. I mean, so, it's Christmas is on Sunday, like every six years. It's not even right. It's, it's not like it's a rare occasion. I, it's it falls on Sunday regularly. I've never in my life heard people say, well, maybe we should cancel church because it's Christmas. Right. That it's so it's it, it it's a way of setting yourself against the history of the church or the, the church, you know, cause, cause the, the people that have already died and gone to heaven are waiting for the resurrection. They're going to be there. So, but we're just picking to not show up at church. So. Oh, oh, is, mm. so it's like, you know, God didn't call the dinner. Come on, hang out with me. Y'all like, nah, we good. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you get, not, not you today, get, Jesus. You get you get the invite to the family meal, and you say, ah, I'd, "I'd rather not." I mean, that's that's why why or why uh, I hadn't. Um, so I didn't celebrate Christmas as was charismatic, and it just started celebrating in the last few years. Why is it so? I've I've watched other people online. Um, have this conversation, this fight, and people are saying, man, why are you making it legalism to show up on Sunday? And I never even questioned whether or not what we're going to do if 
Christmas landed on Sunday. I never even questioned um, yeah. what, what was going to happen. We were going to be at church. That was never a question. Why is this? I, and I mean, but every the, every time this happens, think, this conversation happens, and everybody's. I've seen people say, "Yeah, we're not. We're going to cancel church today and spend it with your family." Um, when this is a this is what I think scares people, particularly certain, uh, uh, particularly Puritans who don't celebrate this holiday because they get the holiday, and it supersedes the very meaning and the purpose that they say they're celebrating it for. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. And I mean, I think this this is. Um, I mean, I've been saying for decades now that the um, modern evangelical American church is the high medieval Roman Catholic Church. Right. That it's break, break the, that it, break that down. So that the the things that we needed reformation for in the. Um, in the during the reformation you see them all now in the evangelical american setting right so at the center of it was uh practices in worship right so the um so he the worship being a performance up front but done by the people up front rather than by the congregation right? oh, central oh, before before you even go any further i just thought about you know i always i really believe as we see it in the church we see in the culture right the church is right. yeah so it flows that way and when you said that all i saw was a bunch of professionals and experts versus everybody else where do we right, and, exactly. and what what do we see that at we see that right now all over the culture even with the pandemic we're the experts we know what's best yep. you sing harmony to what we're telling and what we're leaving if you, if you need to sing at all right did yeah, you right, see that yeah. thing with, <laughs> with the drummers like being s- sent out over the top of the congregation on yeah, wires and stuff that. and i just looked at that and think yeah high medieval roman catholicism right there that's what that is <laughs> it's 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 the spec you've got spectacle up front um and then the and audience in the pews so instead of having a congregation you have an audience right that and that so that's a major part of high medieval roman catholicism that the reformation said no we the we're restoring the the dignity of pew sitting right uh, uh restoring the dignity of of the person in the pew uh, as the ones that are there to worship right so the leader up front is leading the congregation in worship and um so that's a big part of it uh the the um the removal of the sacraments from the people Mm. right so um and there's yeah there's different ways that you do it but i've seen churches that do individual communion now, you know, where you, that they don't do communion on Sunday. Instead, they put out bread and grape juice during the week and everybody comes by and does it individually and nobody bats an eye, right? That's, that was a major issue in the Reformation was whether or not you could have individual communion or whether or not it was a corporate meal that could only be done in a sacramental setting, right? So um, that's, I've seen that grow in popularity um, that's or just taking the, the, the sacraments away. So, you know, once a year was the that was the standard in the Roman Catholic high high medieval Roman Catholic Church, and it's the standard in a lot of evangelical traditions now. Once a year, no, wait, 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 wait. They, they do once a, they do once a month, once a month, Jason. There are, there are places that do once a month, but. You, you can't tell me there's not a bunch of places that do yearly and, and Cor- quarterly, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, my point is, I don't like you once a month. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, once a month was a um, – that was – there were people arguing for for um, less often and people arguing for weekly. And they ended up deciding to do monthly while they worked it out. And now monthly has become a tradition. So – while I mean, they worked uh, it out. So let's not stop. While they worked fi- it out, yeah. yeah. So let's yeah. yeah, let's not stop. Let's figure it out. Are we doing it is it like Passover that you do it once a year, which is which is part of the argument? Or um but the then they look at the at the book of Acts and they do it every time they meet, right? And so you've got people arguing for every time you meet for a 
covenant renewal service, we should have the sacraments. And then you've got people arguing for, well, no, Passover is the central metaphor, and so we should have it yearly. And they say, well, let's do it monthly while we have the debate. And now people still do it monthly all, 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 all throughout um, Protestantdom. Um, but the Roman Catholics weren't doing it weekly then either, right? The 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 Counter Reformation um, heard the arguments for weekly communion from the Protestants and ended up bringing weekly communion into the Roman Catholic Church. So, um, yeah. So, so the, those arguments of uh, I mean, whether you call that a positive or a negative effect, they had an effect. Um, all right. over the place, it, including in the Roman Catholic Church. So you've got what the, the, yeah. the, de, the de, basically the, remo- the, the sacraments being taken away from the congregation, the worship being taken away from the congregation. Um, those were central issues in the Reformation. And now the modern evangelical American church has returned to it, to Roman Catholic style roots. Um, and then... Uh, the the preference the the uh, full time Christian ministry being a holier vo- holier vocation right. than other vocations right that's a made you still see that as a all, all over the place yeah Luther um, did after that in vocations yeah 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 and then um, and then just the the uh, individualization of piety. Right. So um, the the removal of of piety from the corporate civil spheres um, that was a big part of the high church Roman Catholics, right? That you you really divided the world up, um, and your piety was monastic. It was, mm. it, and you have you have really good, you know, pre in pre leading up to pre Reformation folks that I think were real believers pushing for everybody to take a monastic ta- uh, view of their own piety, everybody to, to really push for having a, a separatist individualistic piety. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened in the Reformation was piety became um, something that you, you also did corporately, civilly, um, it was something that also affected, you know, the 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 way that you lived as a city, the way that your um, the the way that you governed, the the way that you thought about, you know, um, the education for everyone, you know, those sorts uh, for you know you thought in terms of how do we get every kid in the town reading, how do we get every kid, you know, so uh, that move away from an individualistic ret- retreatist piety. Um, you know, to a uh, corporate piety, and then I mean, I think at the middle, at the center of it too is, and this might step on toes, ooh, but ooh. a lot of the modern evangelical church's view on money is really similar to the Roman Catholic view. Um, you know, so you're you, um. You hear that push to use your money for a holy cause. Um, It's so similar to, you know, use your money to build St. Peter's down in Rome, um, the holy city, you know, uh, that you, so rather than money being a, in the realm of the, the economy being in the realm of the family, um, there's, you, you see a push for, um, you know, money being something that is dirty and it needs to be cleaned by a whole, by giving it a holy use um, a lot in the American evangelical church. Um, it's an easy way to make people feel guilty for having money and then give it to the church. Um, but it's not a good, it, the, just you give, you give 10% and then more if you want. Um, but it does it's not tithing is not a more holy use of money it's just the it it's the way that we worship with with our whole self you know it's one of the things that we are as economic beings and that we worship that way with the tithe 
And it's just as holy as investing your money uh, in in business and in you know it's it's just part of the right use of money, um, but the, it's in the sphere of the family, not uh, in the sphere of the church. Or not, it, it's not an unholy thing um, that you have to get rid of your guilt with. And a lot of times, these are things that people would agree with on paper. It just comes down to liturgical right. practice. Orthopraxy, right? Yeah. And But then that if you start following that back down, you start seeing that actually, actually it's the issue of orthodoxy um, at the end of the day. Yes, right? And, uh, and, and that's the thing is, not everybody's theology was super messed up. In, even in the high middle ages, um, the, the difference was, um, the, the corruption in the church was you, you've, you'd had, ref, you'd had, you'd had revival type movements all throughout the middle ages, all throughout, um, the history of the church where you come along and people say, okay, we have, we have our theology and and our orthopraxy you know for the most part we've got it right and we just need it to be revived and be committed again what happened in the reformation was the corruption um the, the corruption within the church um had reached kind of a fever pitch and so there wasn't a way to just revive it um it needed to be it, there was a you know a leprosy that needed to be Cleanse. scraped yeah. out um and there were places where the leprosy was scraped out and places where it wasn't and but there was a lot of um interest in reviving religion but there were places where you also scraped out corruption um in places where they didn't okay so i'm gonna try and summarize because i think it's a made the rabbit trail that we just went on and all i asked was <laughs> how in the world do astronomy make you a free person um, and makes one not a slave. And now I'm trying to, rem so if I can summarize, go ahead. Well, I, we, yeah, I, I was, I was going to say that I didn't really answer that yet, but maybe I should give it a shot. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> one of the central um, things, because when, when it comes to freedom, a lot of it has to do with self-control. Control? Control? Um, yeah, self control. Right? Ah, so okay. A lot right. of a lot of freedom traditionally, you know, freedom was was mm. defined as you know control over you that you re remain you retained control over your jurisdiction. So right? that's so how that we get life, liberty, was. and the pursuit of happiness is one's individual right. to have mobility, yeah. own land, and have control over that that he owns. Yeah, and right. so a lot of common law debates had to do with jurisdiction. So things like bridges, they would have debates over whether or not you could make people pay to cross a bridge um, or if bridges were public, you know, if a bridge was public, could you, was it, was it part of the um, part of a free man's uh, ability or a part of a part of freedom was the ability to move around. Um, and if you, had to pay to get across a bridge was it were you saying that this person wasn't free or and so then but if a bridge was on private property then you could you know um because you didn't have the freedom to walk across somebody else's property um but you did have the freedom to uh cross a, a bridge if if you were a citizen so oh, so man. yeah these sorts of debates that had to do with what is free to, what does it mean to be free and what it means is that you have control over your jurisdictions. Your your so self control was a central part of freedom, because you have so if you didn't have self control, then you weren't free um, because something else besides your will was controlling your jurisdiction. Right. So if somebody um, was a, a drunk, they didn't have they didn't have freedom. Um, because alcohol had a hold over them in something that was supposed to be their jurisdiction, but they were giving their jurisdiction over to alcohol. That sort of, um, uh, whereas you have the freedom to drink alcohol, but when you become a slave of alcohol, 
you have lost your freedom. You're so uh, we, 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 don't, we don't actually understand that. That's why I think um, uh, I just want to make this connection in our current minds. We think that that isn't slavery. We think that is freedom. Right. Yeah. So, and so, so what we end up getting, that's why Huxley's, uh, Aldous Huxley's book doesn't really connect to us. I think the way that it should, when we see that people are giving pornography, people are giving alcohol, people are giving all of your favorite lust, gluttony, they're giving it all to you. And you're thinking I'm extremely free. Right. Right. But, but to have our libido dominated from the outside rather than under our mm. own control, right. Our, our lusts, our desires to dominate us, um, is, it is, a, I mean, it is the traditional way that tyrants control people, right? Bread and circuses, um, is a way that they gain control in their jurisdiction, um, because you have lost control in your jurisdiction. And so you no longer can hold them accountable in their jurisdiction. And that's how you do their marriage. Hold them to their, yeah, right, is we'll give you all of your lusts if you give us the power over here. If we're controlled by our lusts, then we don't have any defenses against that uh, encroachment, right? So one of the things that studying astronomy does is it takes a lot of self-control because it's you have to show up consistently in mm. the same place and stop and observe, and then um, it gives you control over your imagination as well, because you learn to see from by learning to see from your perspective um, and be, and becoming aware that you're seeing it from your perspective. You can actually learn to control your imagination in order to see from other people's perspectives, um, which is which is something we're not really able to do mm -hmm. much at all anymore. Um, we because we're critics before we are uh, able to connect with people, right? So, um, mm. and and that's because we don't actually have control over our imagination, right? Our imagination isn't, um, is, uh, we're, we just react, react, react. You know, that's- our imagination. You, no, you're right. And it's just something that I've observed being around you is, um, I am more careful to criticize something when you're around because I am interested. I, I'm intrigued by the fact that I know your theological chops and I know what you're able to see. And there are things that I'll bring up and you're like, that's pretty great. And I'm like, wait, don't you see all the problems in this? And, and, <laughs> and you don't have a problem with, this is the kind of poetic side of you where you don't have a problem seeing those problems and knowing that they don't hinder the reality of which is trying to point to in one way or another, um, which it, that's what happened with Black Panther. When we reviewed, we talked yeah. about Black Panther. That was exactly the, and because I'm, I'm being around you, I'm able to see when I watch Black Panther, I'm like, they made a film about the hunger for true masculinity. It mm -hmm. was, if that was what their job was, if, if they were, I don't think they were intention, intentionally trying to do that at all. But that's exactly what the film did, even against, I think, some of their own wishes. <laughs> right. And I think yeah, that the death of T'Challa made them do that. But and so when when I'm around you criticizing, so I've, I've thought I've thought first, it's more like seeing a piece of chicken. I will eat the meat. And then once I get done with the meat, I'm like, mm, that meat was really, really good. Oh, here's the bones. And right. so that's yeah. kind of become my new. Well, what's it? And, and it throws Christians off because they're immediately knowing there's a bone underneath there. And I'm like, well, right. sure, of course there is. It's a piece of chicken. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you, when you, when you, um, there are times that you can pause to wait, to make a judgment, to let the, um, I had a really interesting conversation with one of my kids who said, about a, they said about a particular TV show, they were like, well, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to watch it because the main character is very um, <coughs> entitled, right? And so I said, well, does the story, uh, does the story argue that the entitlement is a good thing or a bad thing? Mm. Right? And my kid said, 
I don't know. I haven't seen it. I said, well, then you should probably wait to judge it. Right. <laughs> right. Cause having an entitled character is not a problem. If the argument of the story is, and the entitlement was bad, was a bad thing. Um, and, but that's a matter of who, who's controlling, who's controlling my imagination, me or mm. them, right? Well, do, well. I, do I have enough control <laughs> over my imagination to pause and wait to hear the whole argument? Or when I, do I have to, um, do, is my imagination so anemic that it isn't able to hold it, hold, hold and wait for the, the whole argument, hold and wait for the whole story. Okay, so let me push this a little bit because since we're in this conversation, because we're still talking about astronomy, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do that when you know, when you know that this is a, for instance, I think we talked about She-Hulk a little bit yeah, before. Yeah, and, um, I never even finished it because it got so bad so quick. Yeah, I know. I mean, and, and I finished it because I, I didn't know how far you had gone and I was like, I want to have this conversation with you. So yeah. I, I finished it. It was horrible. The ending- yeah, it got, it got, and it, but it turned, it, it, it turned really suddenly. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah. It did. But the, you have to go, don't watch everything. You don't have to watch everything else. Waste your time, but just watch the ending. You, the yeah. reason you need to watch the ending is because when you see the ending, you're going to be like, this is some of the worst imagination and writing I've seen from this, this group. And they've done some bad stuff. Yeah. But how do you, how do you, Right now, Jason, I can't turn on the television without, I mean, it, my net, I don't have Netflix, but I use somebody else's account uh, in a family, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, but every time the top 10, I look at their top 10, all of them, I've I just gone through, almost have some sort of push for homosexuality or a gay person in it. They're, this yep. new show they came out with called The Recruit. You don't make it through the first episode. Almost all of them, all of them have a homosexual plot in there or something in there. And I see that and I'm like, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. The truth is, is that there's a whole bunch of other things that are like that, that are in there. If they have this, that is depraved. So how do you, in, in, in this hard, just how do you deal with that when we're like, we're not watching that. Cause, yeah. I know, mean, I use the IMDb parent thing a lot it's really they do a good job of just laying out here's what's in it they used to um uh, the, <coughs> they, the sometimes it takes them a long time to get up those parent <laughs> warnings anymore because right. i think people were using it in a way, way they didn't appreciate um they were pre-screening uh, but that's the whole point and um but uh so there there are times when you put something on so, um, you know, my, my youngest son, he'll, we'll, we were watching, um, something and, oh man, I can't remember what it was. It was a, it was a cartoon and all of a sudden one of the main characters turns out to be a lesbian <sighs> and the, and Malachi said, oh, they gayed it. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what we did. Yeah. yeah. They went gay. Like, Our line oh. is they went gay. Yeah. And you just think, um, you know what? This is a this is a kids show. There's there shouldn't be any sexual Voltron. tension, right? Yeah, uh, Voltron. I think that might have been the one that we That's were watching. My, my son did the same yeah. thing. Jason, he he finishes because we've been going through Voltron is so good. And one of the right. characters who one of the guys, and all of a sudden turns out to be gay. And I hear a yell downstairs in my house, and I'm thinking somebody got hurt, or you know, right. he's like. Oh, and I'm just hearing it. I come running downstairs. He's like, Dad. And he's almost in tears. They gated, Dad. They went gay. <laughs> right, yeah. They went gay. Right. And you just think, I'm like, All right, well, just way turn to go, it son. off. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You notice it and you just turn it off at that moment. Um, and it, the, it's, and it's not that easy, though. It's not the, Voltron. You're like eight seasons in, seven seasons I in, know, or something like that's that. The, and that's what they that's what they have that kind of patience right there will they know that's what he was so mad oh, about right so they're they're waiting in order until you're so thoroughly invested in these characters lives that it hurts to, desensitize jam and convert yeah. yeah right and so um and you just gotta you just gotta be straightforward about stuff like that you know the um 
And the reality is the market traditionally has punished that and it's stopping. It's not right? punishing they, anymore. They, they pushed hard enough, long enough. They invested their money to the desensitization of it. And, and that's where we are. Um, and the only way to fight back is to, is to raise up an army of storytellers that fight back on the, on the actual playing field. But we didn't have anybody on the playing field. That's, that's a part of the problem is, you know, they're, they're running touchdown after touchdown after touchdown because we put, you know, we put soccer moms in, in our, on, on our front line. Oh, okay. So I got to tell you about this. I got this since we're on this subject and then I want to switch over to, um, have you, and you, I know you're able to think about multiple things at a time. I don't know if you yeah. figured out an answer for my question. I asked I think, you, I think so, maybe. Okay. So let me, let me talk about this real quick. So we went, it's movie night, the Shannon household. I let my oldest daughter just pick the movie. I'm trying to disciple them. She wanted to see this yep. movie. It's called the school of good and evil. It's on Netflix and we saw a trailer for it popped up and it's like, okay, you know, we like watching these and um, working through death, resurrection, baptism, kind of because some of the magical um, stories work through a lot of symbolism, a lot better than some of the other films. And so it's really fun to point some of this out to the kids and um, they really get how the enemy works. They really do. And so we watched it and watching it, we realized like this, this is a little odd, you know, there's this little odd in the beginning, this girl, anytime we see a girl relationship, we're always a little curious and like, mm. Where's or, this going? Yeah. yeah. Or a guy or a guy relationship, like stranger things, even in there was like, what happened? And so we're watching it and I saw the relationship develop and I'm like, they are pushing man out of this and man are the bad guys. It's less he's gay. And you could see that. There's a soft yeah. guy. And so we're watching it. And I'm like, I told my wife, I said, this is halfway through the film. I was like, babe, they're going to screw up the ending. Cause and, and, and so part of this, the, the school, this whole film is about you go here to get trained like Hansel and Gretel. You have a good side, you have an evil side, you have, you know, the princes and you have the, the witches and the warlords and all this stuff like that. So these girls go to different schools and um, these two friends who grew up together, who are really close, you know, one you think should go to the school of evil and the other one you think should go to the school of good, but it actually flipped them. So the good one goes to the evil school, but she's actually evil. And the, the evil one goes to the good school, but she's actually good. Okay, seems legit. They had a close relationship trying to get back together to get back home. By the time you get to the end and they have their big, big fight, the thing that's supposed to move this girl to the place where she needs to be is this true love's kiss. And guess who doesn't give it to her? The guy. Her best right. friend is the one who they replaced the guy with. And so the bad guy um, has actually been playing both sides, good and evil, on their morals to be able to create this world that he wants. Right. And it's great. It's actually it, in one sense, it's been really good because when you look at it, one thing we know right now, the moral imagination of everybody right now knows there's another power behind the things that we see. Right. We all know that nobody is is questioning that at all. And so we know that there is this reflexive attitude to left, right, conservative, liberal and right. And so they're planning. And then this guy is the power behind it so he can have full authority and take over. It's perfect. It's just exactly like the enemy. It's, it's what he, he doesn't yeah. care about Republican or Democrat. <laughs> it's not his, right. he wants to, you know, be emperor of the world. Um, and, and so they come together to fight, the fight him. But the way that they bring back this girl from the dead is her best friend has to kiss her. And at that point, my kids saw it coming. I see it coming and we stop the film before they get there. We're just like, Alex apologizes that. I'm sorry. I'll never pick another movie from movie night again. <laughs> I, I will not, not, not unless you vet it. That, that was horrible. That's the worst movie we've ever seen for movie night. It, and it was, and, but what was amazing about it was watching my kids see all of the little steps that they took. Yeah. 
to recreate their moral imagination, right? Um, and their cosmology. You're like, hey, that's broken. Oh, that's broken. Well, that's not how the print. Well, if you were good, you would hold on a second. Where are you taking me? <laughs> and and so anyway, since we were talking about story, and I just it's amazing to me. You know, we watched it and it was a good exercise, but I never would have picked it for a family movie now, but it was a good exercise in, in watching my kids to see what type of imagination has shaped them over against the one that's like trying to embrace, you know, and, and they were able to to easily reject that. And it wasn't, yeah. not, not everything was on the head. Some things were hidden, but they knew it was coming. Well, and I think that's part of that is, you just got to talk. You just got to be talking to your kids. Right. You and, and you can't, um, you can't, I mean, there are times you have to just sort of lay down the law and say, no, we're not doing this. But if they come and they say, Hey, here's, I'm, I, I'm interested in this thing. This thing has caught my attention and, and caught my desires. There's a way that to say, there's a way to say, no, you shouldn't. Um, that isn't helpful to them, right? If even if if you even if you know it's something that they shouldn't want, there's a way to say, "What about it is what about it is attractive to you? What's the which part of it is attractive? Um, you know uh, what? It, because their entire lives, people are going to try and use good against them." good, mm. good, their good desires against them. Mm. And they have to learn how to identify that, right? They have to learn, um, that, that, uh, you know, the, uh, the proverb seven, a beautiful woman with honey on her tongue, but death in her bed doesn't show up saying, Hey, have you thought about, you know, uh, destroying your life today. Cause I got the, I got an opportunity for you, right? She shows up beautiful with honey dripping on her tongue, things that you should want. Um, but you have to learn how to recognize the, that stairwell goes down, not up. Um, it's a beautiful door, but the stairwell goes down, not up and talking to your kids about it and explaining to them what you see. Well, here, l let me, explain to you why I think, why I know as your parent that that stairwell goes down and not up. Um, we, uh, it helps them to, to learn to not fear and uh, make decisions in fear or make decisions based on what they don't want. Um, because that's the, the quickest way to destroy yourself is always just pick, pick based on what you don't want rather than developing the right desires. That's, that's um, exactly right. Yeah, no, that's and exactly so, right. um, and then just learning, learning to recognize, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, you have to go open the door with them, right? Um, you know, we have these, the, uh, so my, my kids love music. And so we had a lot of conversations about music. Um, you know, something comes on the radio and they're like, man, I love this song. You think, well, what about the song do you love? Have you noticed mm -hmm. this part? You know, um, and helping them to discern like, oh, a, a great beat is not the same thing as a great song. And you can say, man, I love this beat. And, um, and, and say it's, it's a bummer that it's underneath those lyrics because that's not a good song. Right? Have, um, have I told you about the, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, well, and I think, cause you're trying to, you want wise, you want your kids to grow up to become wise adults. Yeah. Right? And, and, a lot of wisdom learns how to make a distinction. So you can say, man, I love that door. Uh, and then you go open it and you're like, oh, but look, it goes down. <laughs> we don't want to take those steps. So let's close the door, right? Because we've learned that that door leads there. Um, and then, and, and that, that, that the, the beautiful door has, is being used as bait um, on a hook that's going to, you know, that pull you up onto the grill to be cooked. I always, I've developed, um, I like to use very gross things for the kids' imagination. Um, yeah. Um, and so I don't, there's certain, I'm actually less likely to stop violence and gross things from them than I am certain um, imagination. So in my house, I would ban all Disney channel, everything, and say, let's watch Die Hard. 
right? Like, I, <laughs> right. like I, yeah. there's there because one, there's a difference in the kind of content, and even with language and other things that we can work through and develop that other stuff I can't get out, right? <laughs> other things are like right. baked inside the cake a little differently. And so there's a difference there, but I've come up with the concept of the uh, PP poopy Twizzler. <laughs> and it's like, you know, imagine getting a Twizzler that is Twizzler on one side and it's really, really good. And it has all the sugars and the candies and it, you can taste it. And it's, and I've worked this concept with them since they were kids and there's nothing wrong with the Twizzler when you start eating it. Now you start eating a little more of it and going, and it's just a little salty. This, this, this sweetness and salt kind of <laughs> start blending together a little bit. And, but, you know, you don't pay much attention to it. And so you just keep eating it. But you notice it's, t- it's t- tasting less like a Twizzler and more salty and weird. And it has given you a different smell. And you start noticing that it gets grimy. And... There's other things in this Twizzler that shouldn't be there. And before you know it, you've gotten comfortable with these flavors. And you can't tell the difference between the beginning of the Twizzler and now you're at the end of the Twizzler that's full of everything that's inside of a toilet. And and you wouldn't know because of the way they do this transition right. in the Twizzler where they don't they want, you know, they're not going to give you a full Twizzler. They want you to have this, but the only way to get you to eat and to taste and to drink all that stuff is if they put the sugar and stuff at the beginning and don't show you what's coming. And and every time I've watched, you know, and and worked that imagination, I remember telling them, like, oh, it's nasty, oh, it's so gross. I wanted something to permeate their imaginations. Yeah. So as soon as they taste something salty, they're like, ah, ah, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> uh-uh. I, well, show me the rest of it. Where is everything else at? <laughs> you know, and so, they're willing to, because I want them willing to investigate certain things and check things out, but to know, wait a second, that ain't right. That don't taste right. It doesn't. Right. I know what sugar tastes like, and so, and and the point is to, the point is to give them good things, so they appreciate yes. good things so much that they know what a good thing tastes like from beginning to end. They know that a, a, that it, it almost gets, you know, when you get down to the end of the Whopper. The best part is the last couple bites of that Whopper because it's all <laughs> meshed together, and yeah. so. While the first bites are good, they get you involved and get you started. Every bite tastes better after that. And then there's this lovely climax of flavors that burst forth right at that last bite with the tomatoes. And the, I love Whoppers. I want, and so I've tried to create that so, so that they love that so much that when they taste something that's off, they're going to be like, wait a second. This right. is no longer what I started. Yeah. <laughs> right? and, I, and I think, but I think that a lot of it, you, the 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 victory comes in teaching them what's good so yeah. that they can identify what's what's bad um uh, and a lot of times parents they they react the same thing to um something being you know uh they they react to something being immoral the same way they react to something being something that they just don't really like. And so their kids don't grow up being able to make that distinction. Right. Um, you know, so <laughs> that, and so they just, then when they find something that they like, that's, they think it must be good. Right. Um, rather than being able to say like, Oh, this, this was, you know, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of hot dogs, uh, but that it, that was a that but that was a fine hot dog. Uh, you know, but you know, there's this steak over here that I really love, um, and then that over there is poison. Don't go anywhere near the poison, right? Um, and being able to make those sorts of distinctions um, with media—that's what kids need—is uh, to grow up and being able to sort through. Um, Oh, that was, that was beautiful poison. Uh, and I understand that it was poison and that they were trying to make it beautiful and I'm not interested. Uh, but that's, if, if they never learn that sort of distinction, then they never learn how to avoid the beautiful poisons. Can I, can I take this? I want to, um, 
I, the question that I have that I make sure I have to ask is when we were talking about calendar, and I'm going to bring this back to that. When we talk about calendar, someone was asking, is there a Christian calendar that I need to have? Cause they were looking for one. They couldn't find one. Like which one do you use and how could you find a good Christian calendar? While you're thinking about that, I want to bring this back to beauty and astronomy real quick. When you are looking at the way that God made the world, the beauty of it, how it's designed to flow and to function and the harmony of it. Um, and you learn to love that rhythm of harmony. Um, when someone plays the beat wrong, you, you jerk. Yeah. Right. When somebody is, you're like, wait, wait, that's out of sync, bro. Like you get, get in beat, like you're out of beat. And then you, so you become angry, not because of, uh, the person, but because of like, this is the, this is the thing that's beautiful. Play to that, play to that right. rhythm. You're, you're messing up the organic beauty that God has given in creation because of the rhythm that you're playing over there. And that rhythm ain't better than this one, not even close. So get yourself in line and jump in the beat. We love to have you because this is the one that's beautiful. Right. This is the one that grooves, right? And when you have that groove and your kids have that groove and have that rhythm, and when you have that rhythm, because you've been looking at, you know, my kids, we go outside, there's an app. Oh, I have to find the app. Um, they all they always find my phone. They put it on my phone and grab. And we look at and it shows you the stars around Starwalk. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Great app. It's a really great app. I and, use it all the time. And you know, just looking at I, I've I just looked at it because it was cool. But knowing yeah. now more about what what's going on and how it's being designed, it makes me think differently about it. Um, but just doing that and seeing that has been huge. Um, for my kids to see how God has designed the world and placed things in a particular order. And then we talk about Christmas in that, you know, and seeing um, the influence of the stars and how they're playing a part in this too. Um, they get the rhythm of the God's world. And I think that's, and that's one of the things like the, the one of the beautiful things about general revelation is to see that rhythm, to hear that beat yeah. and to tell you, man, okay, that's the rhythm right there. How do I groove to it, right? Right. Um, and I, I mean, I think, like you, you see this a lot with um, in modern modern music, um, modern modern jazz, modernist jazz, um, and modern uh, you know classical classical quote unquote music um, is they move away from three three four four six eight. Um, two, four, and, you know, they try five, eight or seven, eight, or, uh, that, that sort of, um, they, they, they want to move the two rhythms that no longer cause your foot to tap, um, mm. and because it, it, uh, because, well, and then it's music that you think about rather than music that you feel the reason things are in three, four four, four, six, eight, two, four is because there are dances that you can dance in those time signatures. Um, so you can waltz in a three, four, you, um, you put it in five, eight, there's not a dance anymore. Mm. You no longer can get your body involved. Um, and the, the, but God, mm. God actually designed music to be a bodily experience, um, to be something that, you, you know, you tap your foot, um, because that's how that's the kind of creature that you are and the kind of thing that music is uh, and that's not a that's not a bad thing that's that's a, a good thing there's there are kinds of music chant and things that um, are designed for other purposes uh, but most music was is a is a corporate communal way of being together of acting together the music uh, provides a way for you to dance together Right. Used to so be that used to be right. And so that's, and that's, what's, that's, what's gone away in the modern world as we disconnect from the kind of creature that we are and the kind of world this is. Um, and it, it, that, and I think that's one of the things that um, classical astronomy, uh, you know, astronomy without a, a astronomy from your, your own perspective, that's what it, it, shows you is what does it look like to live 
with the rhythms of this world that I'm actually living in versus the rhythms of some other thing, right? So if you go out and you, um, you know, let's say you decide that you're going to go out and uh, stay in the same spot and take a picture of 30 sunrises, uh, you start to see the movements of the sun and then you start to recognize the movements of the sun. Um, the, uh, or let's say you're going to go out and you're going to try and take a picture of uh, moon rises. They're harder because they're not, they're, they, not we, always visible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We or well, we organize our life around sunrises yeah. and moon rises are not consistent with sunrises. So you have to do more planning, but you, you see the movements of the moon, the, the phases of the moon, all of that. And you, you come to realize it. And if you live close to the ocean, you start to, to see, feel the, uh, relationship between the tides and the moons and it's there's there's a beautiful dance that creation is going through all around us that's rhythmic that we can actually be a part of um it I, that and that influences us even if we're not even if we're not aware of it but it if we're aware of it it has a uh, the kind of influence that it can have is an imagination settling sort of influence where you say, Oh, I know, I know my spot in this place. Um, I, you know, the, uh, the, I, the, you start, you know, being attentive to your, the place that you're seeing the world from, right. The, the, the perspective that you're seeing the world from. Um, and it, I mean, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it, it does train your imagination so that you can start seeing from other people's perspective, which is a huge, blessing. That's a lot of, a lot of wisdom. Um, a lot of wisdom comes from learning to see from multiple perspectives at once. Um, poetry. Oh yeah. It's a poetic, there's something poetic about it, but we're living in the middle of a, of a rhythmic poem. Um, and, but so often we resist finding our place in the rhythmic poem. Um, and we, but there's no way to abstractly find your place in it. You have to learn to be attentive. Um, you have to learn to see. And, um, and I think that is what a, the difference between a, a person that's, say, not free because the, the, uh, they're constantly living in reaction to people's uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. requests, reaction to what, what people say is important. Um, versus saying, well, no, here's my spot. This is where I live and see from, and this is where I'm going to act from. Um, it's, I mean, my wife you, pointed out you, yesterday. They make you reflexive. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And my wife pointed out yesterday, because I was saying, you know, we were talking about becoming people that act rather than react. And she said, now, of, of course, you always are people that react. You're either reacting to God's grace to you and living accordingly, or you're reacting to the way people treat you and living accordingly. There's no way to not live in reaction. So you're, um, but one of the central graces that God gave us is the world, the the universe, the creation itself, um, and learning to to uh, pause and and I mean, what one of the things that blew my mind when I first started talking or studying classical astronomy is that half of it had to do with the daytime. We don't think of us of astronomy as something that you do during the day, but the sun is one of the major heavenly bodies. Um, I mean, it's the central heavenly body, right? Everything, our whole world um, is powered by it, right? God created a, a sun powered world um, and you know, our body is, is basically, we run on stored sun energy that we get from the plants or from the animals that eat the plants, right? We, we, we are, we are sun dependent. Um, and, and then every, I mean, every plant is dependent on, um, the sun it's dependent on the wind. Um, it, it's, it's a, it, it takes air. Um, uses sun power, it takes air and converts that into 
carbon that we can use. So it takes you know, carbon dioxide and takes the oxygen off of it and converts the carbon into something that we can use to. Are you sneaking up a, on a sermon on me? Are you sneaking up on a sermon? That sounds like <laughs> but, you're sneaking up on a sermon. I mean, it is. It's 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 sun and wind. That, uh -huh. um, you know, that, that's what that's what it, that's what a plant needs to survive. And if that if that doesn't immediately start make you say like, oh, it needs sun and wind, that sounds familiar. Is that S O N or S U N? <laughs> and I mean, and the wind is obviously the spirit, right? I mean, like God has <laughs> and water, right? So it needs, right. it needs water, sun, and wind um, to make. The things that we're made of so we're we're water we're made of water sun and air with sun and wind and that's so, so there's this um the the creation is a gift from god and we can either live in it as we find it um and try and bring it to its intended end by god or we are slaves to it right we uh, um or or we fight against it which uh is what we end up doing a lot but but if we're going to, uh, we we have a lot of identity issues in our world right now, right? And I don't think it's a it's a mistake or it's it's a coincidence that we have identity issues and we have stopped studying astronomy, right? We've stopped. We we people still might learn some things astronomical but they don't learn them from their own perspective they don't learn them in any usable sense any sense in which they can say oh here's my relationship to the moon to the sun here's my relationship to you know uh, we, we we learn about it as if we can stand objectively outside the solar system and watch it you know jason this is this every time we talk the more and more we talk i keep on i keep saying this and i i I don't know if it's registering, but for me, it's hit so hard. All of our problems, every last one of them are a cosmological problem. Every, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, if once you get to, and you've said this before, but once you play with someone's cosmology, then you've, you've got control no matter where they're at in the, in the, what they're thinking or how they're operating. You've already taken control of, you've moved the game from chess to checkers I don't care if you still have the pieces. Uh, you've moved. You've changed the game when you start messing with the cosmology, right? The 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 way your cosmology is ordered and how you think about this really does influence everything else downstream of that. And I think what is so hard is we don't. Our imaginations have been thinned. And we don't have control over them anymore because we, we think of certain things like this. And this is what I was talking about with that video is when they say, actually, we don't have enough control over our own imaginations to question that. Why are you talking about our imagine? Why are you talking about me? <laughs> why you, why you, you're just going to talk about me like that. Dang dog. You should be gentle. So, but be as gentle. soon as, but, and, but it, when you, cause uh, astronomy is um it's like lifting weights for your imagination right it's it's uh it's latin i mean studying languages is the same sort of thing right you um you i mean especially in ancient language but really any language you know if you've got if you can say they would say this this way in english we say this this way in english but in spanish this is the perspective they bring and you can imaginatively enter into multiple perspectives about something through different languages. You're gaining control over your imagination and it's no longer, your imagination is no longer just living in response to you know, in, in response. It's a, it's a self dominion. It's a dominion in your, uh, in your own jurisdiction type of exercise. So let's talk about the calendar. Let's talk about the calendar because I think this is where, as you know, as we're understanding the calendar, we're being discipled back into a, a more biblical cosmology, right? We're, we're right. Um, that's we have some anchors to get us back to 
where we're supposed to be at. Now, how do you how do you m- merge all that you're saying ab- about astronomy with biblical theology? Because I don't think that there's a, no one is, I think you can hear the first part of our conversation and be like, that's really good, but you guys are really missing out on biblical theology in this because you don't see that in the Bible. Right. Well, but you do, I mean, you do see it in the Bible. Um, let me, let me know if I'm misunderstanding or if I'm understanding you. So when you say you just change your color of your screen up there because your face just I turned did. red. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I was pulling up some, uh, pulling up a, a document. Oh, okay. Um, what um, I, go ahead. Well, because you, by biblical theology, do you mean we haven't yet talked about how the Bible talks about astronomy? Yeah. I think or do so. you mean biblical theology, like the, the history, because there's because sometimes when we say biblical theology, we mean what does the Bible say? But other times there's a technical definition of biblical theology that has to do with the progression of salvation. Right. No, I think what, how the Bible deals with astronomy is what I'm thinking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, because on the did we talk about the fourth day last week? Because on the fourth day, when God puts the sun, the moon and the stars yeah. into the heavens, right, there's already light in the day and in the night, but then the day and the night are, there are astral, astral bodies that are put in charge. They're given authority over the day and the night. Um, and they're, we're told they're beautiful. Um, the, uh, so this is, I was, I was, I was pulling up Genesis one, um, so I could read it. I wish I just had it memorized, but this is 14 through 19. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of, of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and uh, and for days and, and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so Mm. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day, right? So on the fourth day, we're actually told a lot about, um, about the, the sun, the moon, and the stars being put up there, right? They're, they're, they're rulers. lights. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're lights, they're rulers. And that, um, that becomes really central because they become a central symbolic way to talk about the rulers of the earth and authority and authority structures. Right. So when we get uh, the, when we get to like the destruction, the promised destruction of Babylon, um, it says we're going to tear down, God is going to tear down the sun, the moon and the stars of Babylon. Right. So the authority structure um, be of the, of the time of the authority structure of time and of, of over creation, creation moving through time is the sun, the moon, and the stars in the old covenant. And then the people put in charge by God are called the sun, the moon, and the stars of that particular sphere. So it becomes symbolic. Um, we're told I, all throughout that... the Bible that they're there for beauty, um, which I think is obvious, but we, maybe not, but the architecture of the universe is actually beautiful, right? That, that it's a, it, the kind of place that God built, he built a beautiful house called the universe, um, you know, can, with a ceiling, gorgeous. So when you, when you talk about rulers and authority, I think another place you can see that is when Joseph has his dream of the sun, moon, yep. and stars bowing down to him, right? Um, that's why they were so upset. They understood what that meant. And so it's right. like, who are you that? Yeah, who are you? Because he says, and then the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bow down, and they're like, oh, so mom, dad, us, that your dad, mom, and the princes, they immediately understood that that symbolism was uh, had to do with the authority uh, authorities, right? Um, but we still do this when we got fifty stars on our <laughs> on our right. You know, we, uh, on our flag, um, you know, you, the Asian flags tend to have moons 
um, because they're still a lunar, they they still run on lunar calendars. So, you know, Chinese New Year is uh, a lunar New Year is when the the moon has gone through all of its uh, cycles for the year. Um, And then in the Middle East, you you tend to have uh, stars or moons and stars. Uh, it, uh, uh, Japan, I think, has a sun rise, so or at least it used to. So, you, but you, so, so the 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 symbolism is not lost. Um, it's still there. It's still all around us. We've just been become blind, right? We sold our eyeballs for uh, in in to in we traded our our eyeballs for technology. Is that and so? Now we don't see the symbolism but it's still all around us but that just means that just points to how illiterate we are that's yeah, what illiteracy yeah. is when we, people think that when we talk about liter, uh, literacy we're talking about just being able to read that's not what we're talking about right but if but what'd be interesting is you know when you go if you went through a revolution now and somebody had to create a new flag they wouldn't have enough knowledge of symbolism to create a, a usable flag most of the time anymore um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really interesting, but the, uh, mm. but so we're told that they're symbols. We're told that they, that it's a clock, right. The, the, um, for day and night, uh, we're told that it's for seasons, right. For like festivals, religious festivals is the word underneath seasons. Um, and, uh, th- and, you have this really interesting, um, this, this really interesting when it's when it tells us that they're festivals, um, that God is saying, "I'm going to mark out seasons and festival times for you, right? so that you know that you should have the kind of year where you pause and remember at different times." And in the old covenant, they're all lunar festivals, lunar all of the the, the the regulations are lunar um, because the whole religious calendar of the Israelites is a lunar calendar. Um, it, they're under, they're under the moon in a very specific way in the old Testament uh, there because the sunrise of history hasn't come yet. Uh, and, and that, and the it's, they start, you start getting the prediction of a sunrise coming Um the in in the prophets um and but the the and then i believe the last prophecy in the old testament is that the sunrise is coming in malachi right so that the end of the rule of the moon um over god's people is coming and jesus turns out to be the sunrise uh so you so in terms of the god's people um it's it's you know malachi 4 says and I think it might be right at the beginning of Malachi four, but it's, I think it's the last prophecy. Um, you've got this coming sunrise. Um, and then, uh, when, when Zechariah, uh, that's the preference that Zechariah references when John the Baptist is being born, right? It's time. It's that time in history when you move from the rule, you move away from the rule of the sun or the rule of the moon because the sunrise is coming. So the, so there was evening and there, there was morning is not just how the day works. It's also how the history rule. works. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you've got this uh, movement of history from evening to morning. And Jesus is the one who brings in the sunrise. He's the, uh, and so the, it's not just, uh, I mean, we, we actually, until 1967, we still ran everything according to from sunrise to sunrise to sunrise. That was how we calculated our clocks and everything. Um, we switched over to the the vibrations of a cesium atom in 1967, with the atomic clock being being becoming the official clock of the world. The atomic clock. I can't even remember where the atomic clock is. The cl- atomic clock is kept Geneva maybe but there's an atomic clock now that is the official clock of the world um, but the um, that's just uh, a way of of trying to 
drill down on the accuracy of the measurements of the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? It's always been, um, that's always been the clock of the world, that the sky is the clock of the world. Um, and it, it's the clock and the calendar, right? So um, it can't you know, help, it can't help but be because of the rule that was given it, right? So there is no other way that man would even adjust the time apart from the sun and the moon right. and the star. Like, it's, it's just impossible. And um, that, yeah, there's, it, it is, it's just, it is, there's no way around it. Um, we, with the invention of electric lights, um, we do our best to refuse to, to live by it. <laughs> um, but that, uh, and there are times, you know, I've had to work night shifts in factories and things. And, um, there are times that God gives you where you don't get to just say, well, you know, I'll be up with the sun and I'll go to bed when the sun goes down, you know? Um, but the, uh, it doesn't affect the sun that we ignore it. <laughs> Right. It's still there. It, it still keeps And moving. it still has so, an impact, yeah. Right. Um, and But when Isaiah wants to talk about uh, the how revolutionary the work of the Messiah is going to be, one of the things he does is he says the heavens are going to be replaced. Right. The, heaven, the authority of the heavens are going to be handed over. So we'll have some a different authority above us um, than we have had since the beginning of creation. So when Jesus recreates the world um, in the tomb and comes out to rest on the, on that first Sunday, uh, on, on that first Easter, one of the things that has happened is that the sun, the moon, and the stars have handed over their authority to Jesus. And so now Jesus um, is the authority of the heavens because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says, right? So, well, what was the authority that they had? Well, the, it was the authority to have time set by them, set according to them, right? So when the church says, well, how do we set a, how do we set a calendar? You used to set it according to the authorities in the sky, uh, the authorities of the heavens. Well, who has the authorities of the heavens now? It's Jesus. So, to say I'm going to set our calendar uh, according to something other than around the life of Jesus is for the church to just say, well, not all authority in heaven has been given to him, right? There's authority. There's other. There's some other authority that we are organizing our calendar according to. Um, but uh, when, when Isaiah predicts the new heaven and the new earth in the resurrection of Jesus, um, and we get that new heaven and the new earth told to us that by Jesus, I'm the authority in the heavens. I have all the authority of the heavens now. If I mean, I think it doesn't make sense to not set the calendar. Now we're told that the calendar is set over time by the work of the church and not in a legalistic way. And we're told, you know, there's uh, that it's, that it, it's for freedom that we now celebrate and that we're not supposed to let anybody judge us according to which, holy days we keep and holy days we don't keep and um, how we set the count that, that it's that the, the authority uh, um, to set the calendar properly has been handed to the church and it's supposed to set, use it in a gracious way and, and set it in a gracious and joyful way. Um, and uh, so that that's all true, but all the authority of the sun, the moon and the stars is now held by Christ and so the calendar should be referencing Christ because he's the, you know, the, the same way that you had the calendar referencing the sun, the moon, and the stars before right? you were in the, you were in the, the sunrise was in Aries and that's how you knew which month you were in, right? You knew that it was May because the sun rose in the Ram. Now we sh it should all be referencing Jesus over time. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking we've talked before, before about when Christ was born, the angels or the planets or the stars, the stars yeah. brought the wise men. Yeah. The, you know, yeah. You have a star that brings the wise men. That's Luke two. Right. 
Um, and, we, we and, should read it because it's so it's so crazy and revolutionary what this text actually says. Yeah, I, um, I remember when we talked about it before, it blew my head because I'm like, but part of what's happening is they are giving their authority to Jesus, right? That's where, and they're saying here, here is, here is the Lord you've been looking for. Oh yeah, you're looking right. for, I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, um, so we'll start, we'll, we'll start with the angels and the shepherds because I think that one is yeah. really crazy too. Um, so Luke 2, verse 8, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you uh, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And, and this shall be assigned unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. The heavenly host is the stars, right? It's, it's, the, it, that phrase means the same thing every time it's used everywhere else in the Bible. The heavenly mm. host is the stars. The heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, right? So the stars come down and then the stars are called angels, right? And all, so all those different angels now go back up into their place in the sky, right? They're, the stars come down and they announce um, glory to God in the highest and on earth, earth peace, goodwill toward men. When I when I meet people that are really into astrology um, and they're saying, well, here's, you know, let's, we got to look at the stars and we got to see what they're saying and what are they, what are they telling us? And, um, or you meet, you know, you meet people that are in uh, um, ast astrologically founded religions um, uh, like, well, um, oh man, there's, there's more and more of them now. This is always the passage I go to because I say, well, I don't think you're listening to the stars very well. This is what stars say when they show up. Mm. So if, if the stars are telling you, uh, go to Jesus, the way they told the shepherds, then you know you're dealing with stars. Um, if they're not telling you to go to Jesus, then the stars, then you're not dealing with stars. This is how, this is what stars say, what stars talk about. Um, and the other, uh, the other place, uh, that's really, I think super interesting is, uh, the, when you go, um, to the wise men, the astrologers, uh, of the East, the Magi, uh, this is Matthew, which is Matthew too. Let's get over there. You have stars show up there as well. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east, magi, astronomers, astrologers, uh, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was with him. So the star says, Go to, go to the, the king of Israel is go, going to be born. Go worship him. They say, okay. And so they go to Jerusalem where the throne of Israel is. Uh, that's where you would expect the king to be born. But Herod acts funny about it because he has not had a kid. Um, but all of Jerusalem is troubled with him. Right. So this is a public announcement. The king of Israel has been born. And we're here to worship him. We've brought gifts. It's a and all and Jerusalem is worried. Jerusalem has a they have a, a Jerusalem has a uh, favored place in the Roman Empire at this point, and so um, Jerusalem is troubled that this sort of prophecy is is coming to pass, and so 
Herod gathers all the chief priests and scribes and demands, uh, where is the Christ going to be born? Right? They, they know that the, all the predictions of the Messiah are about to come to pass. And, and so they say to him in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, for thus it is written by the prophet, thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod uh, calls the wise men and, and asks diligently, what time did the star appear? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young man. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So um, now he kills all of the children under two based on this. So he's the, he's the, the Pharaoh. And we learned that Israel is the, is Egypt right now. Um, and Herod is the true Pharaoh and, mm. and Jesus is the real Moses. And there's a lot going on in this passage. Um, but the, the travel time that it took from them to get from India or the East, wherever the, they were in the East to, uh, give, lets him know that if we kill all the boys under two, we're good. Right. So it, it took them some time to travel over there. Uh, and then verse nine says, when they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. This isn't a, um, this isn't trigonometry that they're doing to figure out which house to go see in Bethlehem. Right, um, they, they the star actually leads them, and then stands above the house, right? And and then um, they go into the house, and the the star apparently goes back up to his spot to wait. So um, we're not told which star it was that was given this job, but one of the stars was honored with this particular job of leading the wise men, of visiting them in the east telling them to go and then move, walking them from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, which is about eight, eight, 10 miles. If I remember right, right. It's a day's walk. So now, um, you, now, now we don't just have talking snakes and donkeys. We have right. stars we have that stars. come down, talk, sing, walk and stand. Yeah. It, it, they, they at least stand. They, they, I mean, in my mind, they, he floated in front of them, but maybe he did walk in front of them. That's a good, I hadn't thought that through. Um, it does, cause it doesn't actually say how they, how he travels now in, in the old, you, the older Christian debates about this, cause they did, they had a cosmology in which the stars, stars being angels, wasn't a problem. Um, they had debates about, do they, do they live? in the star like it's a house or is it like the star is the body and the spirit can come down apart from the star or do they ride around on the star like like a, a horse you know or like a don you know is the star their their steed um and uh, but they didn't have any problem with the star being a sentient being mm. um so uh because the they didn't have, um, they didn't have, they didn't name how, why things move according to forces. So we say, why is it that the stars go around us? Well, it's because of gravity. When you say, well, what causes gravity or what is gravity? Gravity is the name we give to a, a force we can't, we don't have an explanation for, an understanding of, right? We know that. Um, when you drop something, it falls. Um, we call the force gravity. Then we think we've explained it. <laughs> we, right? We just named it. Oh, yeah, we're it's gravity. To, gravity, yeah, we're gravity supposed got it. to name it. Yeah. Gravity, gravity caused it. We're supposed to name it. That's our job as as Adams and Eves. Um, so that's not. It's not a problem. But we we think we've explained it. Um, where, where in the in the old days when they said why did why does the sun the moon and the stars the old days meaning the middle ages you got maximus the confessor explaining why is it the sun moon and the stars move this is well because they've been given 
their liturgical jobs in the worship service of creation. Mm. Right? They, and they love the Lord. So they're happy. To, they dance through their liturgy um, in daily, monthly, yearly, uh, in the daily, monthly, and yearly liturgies that God has given them um, because they love the Lord, right? They're motivated by love for their creator uh, to move through the sun, the moon, to move through their places. Um, it's a part of their worship. Um, and we, we want to, uh, we, in our imagination, the world is a, the, everything, uh, everything up there is dead, cold, silent. Uh, we haven't been up there to experience that, right? We, it, we assume things, um, because, we look out there and uh, with a with cosmological assumptions. We, we we look up into the sky with cosmological assumptions. I mean, we know space is cold, though, right? Uh, we know. I mean, we we know that space, yeah, like the space between here and the moon, right? Yeah, we know that the space space between here and the moon is cold. We haven't right. been further than that, so. What are you trying to say, Jason? I mean, I'm just just phenomenologically, we are we. There are places we haven't been. I mean, but, but we've we, sent we've but sent. We'll describe them, right? Yeah, we've we've sent satellites out, and right. So, but it's it's the um, one of the things that uh, that I think we we're really comfortable with is just extending our experience onto other out, yeah, yeah, yeah onto yeah. other things and and you know maybe it is maybe it is cold I, i'd be surprised if it was quiet out there although maybe even you know um that's just uh that that's just because i i've never experienced complete silence right i mean it's a um so to imagine that the entire universe is quiet except for right here that I mean, that'd be, that'd surprise me. Uh, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mess anything up. We don't have, it doesn't mess anything up theologically if the angels are, you know, worshiping in spiritual, with spiritual voices and not physical voices. Uh, but it just, it still would just surprise me. <laughs> so what kind of calendar, did you think about what kind of calendars would be good Christian calendars for people to use? Cause I know some people have tried to find some, they find the Catholic one and they find it, but Protestant yeah. camera cal uh, calendars, there's hard to, this is not inside of a tradition right now. Well, there, um, you, I mean, Lutherans have a, a lot of good calendar stuff. Anglicans have a lot of good calendar stuff. Yeah. I think some people found the Anglican calendar. Yeah. Traditional Anglican calendars, um, you know, cause there's even, there was there's a lot of evangelicalism within Anglican, you know, the Anglican Church historically, um, but I mean, I, in my mind, you just you start with what you've got, you, um, and with whatever your local church is using. And uh, dip, 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 no, they ain't using one. I'm gonna tell you right now, <laughs> most local Other, churches well, aren't using one. But they they have Easter and. Christmas at least, right? Sure. Most of the time? Yeah, but then there's no Advent. I mean, the 12 days of Christmas, that's usually not the case. I don't think right. but, there's, but, you know. But that's what I'm saying. You start with what you've got. So if you look at and you say, okay, my church recognizes um, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, Good Friday maybe, um, and say, how do, how do I start by making – by filling out those celebrations. And then when you've got those really rolling, say, man, this is so good. What other celebrations can we add rather than trying to find something that's complete and, and impose it whole hog to just say, what have we already got? How do we fill out those celebrations mm, better? Interesting. Um, and then, and then add in once you've got those things going well. I mean, it's just like, um, if you're not if you're not already making it to church every Sunday, 
then and if you're taking off there. Christmas, <laughs> right, yeah, if you're taking, well, yeah, well, if your church is taking off Christmas, find a new church. That's <laughs> there's very, there's, I, I, there, it's and it's rare that I say, man, you find gotta a new church, find a new church. You know, um, the there's a couple of things. You know, if you got a woman pastor, if find you're taking it, church, you're so if, you're, yeah. if you're taking off Christmas, you know, there there then definitely find a new church. Um, the but you know the it's easy to say I need something I need to I need to add things when you're not doing the things you are yeah doing the things you've already got right so so make you know make um I know people that they have just, all, all they've added is like Sunday brunch after church and inviting people over and it's just been transformative like we're, we're gonna make our Sundays better or they added a Saturday night um Saturday night you know, kind of like Sabbath meal yeah um and it's been hugely transformative. And they say, oh, man, this is so good. What's next? And that's right. what you want. What have I got? How do I, how do I embrace what I got when it's so good? You say, man, how do I add to this? That's, that's the long-term sustainable way. Okay, to- but if you, if you got that and you're already doing that Sabbath dinner, what, what, what could someone grab? Okay, even so, let's say that somebody's like, you know what? I agree with you. I'll decide to bite it off small chunks at a time. Yeah. But I would love to see the whole thing. Uh, and what is Trinity season? Why is it summer called Trinity season? Well, so some in some traditions it's called Trinity season, and in some traditions it's called ordinary time. Ordinary um, time. Yeah, ordinary time. So, and uh, we tend to think that ordinary is an insult, um, but they they call it ordinary time. Um, so you've got the 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 cycles of the uh, you've got the, the cycles of the festivals and then ordinary time. And then you go back into the cycles of the festivals and ordinary time is just, you, you uh, Sunday worship is the, is the marker of it. And then it starts back in it. Uh, and other people call it Trinity season. Um, and, uh, and some, some traditions also add Trinity Sunday um, where at least once a year, you get a sermon explaining the Trinity, <laughs> right? Oh. It's a, a reminder to have. So Trinity season kicks off with Trinity Sunday. The reminder is we, the Trinity is so our God is, is revealed as triune. That's the thing that makes him different than all other small G gods. And so once a year we have Trinity Sunday, a sermon reminding and celebrating and explaining the Trinity. I, which I think is really a good, that's a really good practice. I, the training. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I don't think there was a lot of, when I think about it, there weren't a lot of sermons talking about the Godhead and the Trinitarian Godhead. Right. Uh, Explaining the much. Trinity. Yeah. It's easy. It's easy to assume and forget to, to celebrate it. Um, but that God has that, that's the thing that sets our God apart as the creator. God is his, he's revealed himself as triune. Um, and no other gods are triune. So um, we, we should be, that should be, you know, so, so uh, that's what I like about, so Presbyterians usually call it ordinary time and not Trinity season. Lutherans call it Trinity season, but I appreciate that about the Lutheran tradition. And I really like Trinity Sunday. Um, and, but the, um, so, I mean, if you're just, if you're just looking for, here's a great overview. Um, you know, you just, I would just search the internet for Presbyterian church calendar or Lutheran church calendar. If you're in a Lutheran church or, you know, um, the, uh, Baptist church calendar, if you're in a Baptist church and, and look at, look at what, what are, what are you using in your tradition? Embrace it, love it, enjoy it. And then, you know, all things are ours in Christ that our inheritance is, is, we, everything is our inheritance in Christ. So we can, you know, bring things in from other traditions. Um, but there's a, an ecclesiastical authority that can be, that brings things into worship or not. It's the, it's the job of the ecclesiastical authority to set what the readings are for worship services, what songs we sing, you know, all of that. Um, but within your own jurisdiction, um, you've got a lot of freedom to, to celebrate and enjoy the church calendar for I, you your know, family. 
I was just thinking about this. Um, could you imagine a nation or just, let's say a group of, a, a, we got a lot of Christians in America. Let's just say the Christians in America decided to take their calendar seriously and put on festivals that the civil magistrate did not control or wasn't over. Right. Because here's, here's, here, I wonder, I wonder if that wouldn't be a beginning to a revival that gets marriage back from the civil magistrate that I mean, I, reorganizes I think that, that would be probably the, the spheres the of authority that he has to start, to start with, you know, if you're looking for leverage, because we're go ahead. Oh, sorry. You, you paused up. What were you saying? Yeah. I, 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 I wonder if these disciplines don't start, um, you know, when you have a mess in a house, everybody sees that mess and they're like, oh my goodness, where do we start? And it's like, you always start from the top of the pile and what you have access that you can do. So if the top of the pile has the heaviest thing you can't read, well, find the thing that you can lift and then move yeah. that. And then as you continue to peel off that pile, you finally get to the bottom of it, but you got to start with what you can carry, what you can reach and what you can do. And sometimes it's in a home, um, just, I, I have, Jason, I've given up on, trying to win at politics it's not i never had that desire i gave them that a long time ago and so one of the things that um i've spent my energy on is focusing since we start across politics i said every time we end a show if you're single get married if you're married have kids if you have kids baptize them right those Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Now, go fight, laugh, and feast. Th th there is uh, a basic order to things that controls. The Once you get that, yeah, you know, that's that's the rudder, man. Like, that, that controls the whole ship. It goes that direction. And if you can get those things in place, and you can get that family looking at, the the new ruler and and creating festivals around his victory and his rule and and believe that and throw parties in in thankfulness to him for that that's going to have an effect in society right it's like why are those people partying like that <laughs> right uh, and and it comes from this goes back to Titus right this is what Titus is talking about like husbands love your wives um, teach the the young uh, the older women to teach the younger women to love their husbands and care for their families, and then so that it stops the mouth at the end of the day of your opposer, right? And and it creates a and we've talked about this before. Just that kind of attitude is contagious. The gospel is contagious, and seeing it practically worked out is like, wow! I don't I y'all 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 serious about this, huh? <laughs> right, right. Well, I think I I mean when when they it, if your if your family is the one that delivers cookies you know around christmas to the whole neighborhood and your family is the one that um is that is throwing the parties and having a good time and then they say hey we're going to start arresting christians and they show up to arrest you then the whole neighborhood says wait what but they're right. the ones to deliver right. fudge. I don't that I I know I know them as the ones that uh celebrate, right? I know them by their celebrations. I know them by the uh their their joy. I know them by their love of by their love of the neighborhood, love of the neighbors. Um that has a different effect. I think I've told this story before, but when I was out in uh I was when they were restarting the schools after the Iraq war, I was doing teacher training over there. And I was talking to one of the gentlemen who was, he'd been a, um, an evangelist in um, one of the cities over there. And one of the things that the evangelists do it, um, in Muslim countries is they start liquor stores because Christians can drink and Muslims can't. Um, and so it's a quick way to find the Muslims that are already disenchanted. Right? Um, Interesting. They, sh they show up at your liquor store, you know, they're bad Muslims. And so they're, you're, they're, they're, they're good uh, fodder for the gospel. 
um, which I thought was brilliant. Right? It was really smart. Uh, and so I was talking to this guy, and, and he was saying, you know, I've been I've been an evangelist twenty years, and I said, what's the hardest thing about uh, about uh, being an evangelist here? And he said, well, or about being a Christian um, in here in the Middle East. And he said, you know, sometimes it feels like God has forgotten you. And I and I foolishly, what I said was. Oh man, I know how that feels. He was like, and, and he, in his response was, like the time our pastor disappeared and was returned to us a month later in pieces in a number of boxes. You like, do, you do not know how that feels. Oh, oh yeah, I nope, I don't know how that feels, and and so now I'm just feeling shame that I responded that way. And he and he said, but what happened? He said, I, um, he said the the most. So that, that that had happened two years previous, and he said our church has doubled in size, um, and our he said and I went I had I had had one conversion, um, at, uh, up bef- in the first eighteen years uh, as an evangelist, and I've had hundreds since. He said because when they saw the blood of a pastor that they that they had known. They they uh, finally understood the blood of Jesus. Right. Mm. So this man had lived in the community, had 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 not himself successfully been evangelistic, but he had a reputation for being a good man in the community, for being uh, um, a, a an upright guy, um, and he had the respect of the community. When Saddam Hussein had him murdered and returned to the city in a box as a way of saying we got to get these Christians in line. The whole city said, but I knew that guy. And so he said, people started showing up at church wanting to know, uh, wanting to know what Christianity was now, because they said, well, if a good man is being attacked by the bad man, Saddam Hussein, who we, who, who we know hates his people. um, I need to know what this Christianity business is. And that, so um, and I was I, I got to preach at the second anniversary of the uh, legalization of Christianity after Saddam Hussein was removed and um, hear in Arabic through a translator um, the story of every person that had gotten baptized in those last two years. It was so such, wow. a, such a blessing such a to, to get to be there. Um, but the it was, this man that was known uh, for his for his place in the community being arrested that cracked open the gospel the imagination um, of the community to the gospel uh, and and so it was an amazing thing to hear and see but it was because of the way he had lived for years and years in that community that made his martyrdom effective in that way um, so the uh, in you know whether or not martyrdom is is coming in our country or not, I think that that should our goal should be to be to have that kind of influence on our neighborhoods and our on you know to, to not live in retreat, um, but to be the ones that are uh, you know making the rounds with the fudge and celebrating Christmas and celebrating Easter and uh, and and uh, uh, visibly uh making it known that we love our love that we are joyfully celebrating so okay um we've had an outpouring of emails come in over the last week um it's been last two weeks it's two weeks now yeah that was your christmas present from the <laughs> it was it was very it was very <laughs> moving I, it, I, yeah it, overwhelming uh, at times it was very it, um wow um thank you guys every last one of you guys has sent in an email or a message or a text um thank you um that was awesome uh it, but one of the things that i was thinking about you know because part of what we've done is just say hey how do we take this and i, I didn't count see how many shows we got i think we're um I think we hit our mark a little over our mark 54 or something like that for shows. But I was thinking about like next year, 
you know, what is, you know, when you're talking about calendar and you're talking about cycles and, you know, when, when obviously we're coming into a new year, there's always like a reset and everybody observes everything. When you think about calendars, how should, how should Christians think about end of year, beginning new year? What is, you know, with all of this in sight, how do, I mean, if we're supposed to be, um, you know, if the calendar is now in the hands of the church and we have this cycle, what, what is, what have we supposed to learn from this in this, this 12 month cycle in the beginning of the new year? What, how do we look at, we know how the world kind of looks at it, how kind of the civil calendar looks like a, a full reset. Is that the process or Our, our thing blacked out, you know, so is it the process of a full reset? Yeah. How, how does the Christian calendar get, have, help us look at this December's any January's been, because it doesn't look like that the way it's set up, that there's this break there in the yeah, Christian well, calendar. I, it, in the, well, you've, the January 1st is the beginning of our civic calendar. So, yeah. which is a real calendar too, right? We've got calendars layered on top of one another. We got family calendars, right? Because each each jurisdiction has a calendar. So, but um, but we want them all to be used well and and used wisely. And so, um, I think of January first um, the in the way that God's mercies are new every morning. One of the reasons that God put the cycles uh, into creation, um, the the one of the reasons He gives us a daily sunrise is to remind us of how merciful he is, that there's new, fresh mercy, new grace every morning. Well, so we should understand every cycle that way, the yearly cycle as well. So there's a new freshness to God's grace and mercy in the coming year. And this is where I think that that um, that video that you sent is actually a good way to think about the calendar, um, that it's it does spin, but it also moves forward. So it's not it's not a, an endless cycle in the in the cyclical pagan understanding of things. It's a it's a cycle that moves us forward. And so that that rotating spiraling uh, image that you showed uh, is the way I think of the new year. What does it look like for us to move uh, to for us to move forward into the next grace? to move forward into the ne- into the, into the new mercy that God has for us this coming year. So my wife and I, um, we, we just sat and talked a bit about what habits do we want to establish? We tend to think of sanctification in terms of getting new ideas, uh, rather than establishing new habits. Uh, but that's really, uh, sanctification is, is the, hmm. the reformation of our habits. Um, it, not just getting a new idea here, getting a new idea there. If we get new ideas and it doesn't become a new habit, if it doesn't become a new way of of loving and caring, it's a, it, what's the point of of growing in our theology? Um, the, if we if we don't become a more uh, loving person, a wiser person, that, that our life isn't changed by it. Um, but the habits of our the habits of body, habits of mind, habits of family um, are, are uh, um, should be organized around the mercy, responding to the mercy and grace of God. So, um, you know, my wife and I, we spent some time yesterday talking about what are the, what, what habit do we want to add to our family life at the beginning of this coming year? Um, it, to, but it takes time to establish a habit. And I think this is where Gnosticism wants us to think we just got to change out the ideas in our head. Um, but that is a, there's a timelessness to that way of thinking. What we need is to shift and change the way we interact over time, in time, with time. And that's where the, the habits come in. So um, I think of the new year as a way of, uh, of looking at the habits that I went through this year and thinking, which habit can I improve on which habit can i add which habit fell off that i wish it wouldn't have fallen off and re look at work on reestablishing it um but because it because it's uh, a mercy opportunity it's not a 
Um, it's not, it's not a guilt shame sort of situation. I mean, if, if there's guilt, you just ask for forgiveness and Jesus says, I forgive you. And then you move on, right? If it's a shame situation, you remember that Jesus died naked on the cross for you and leave the shame up there and then say, um, what does it look like for me to become more like Christ? Cause I got new mercy. How am I going to respond to it? I got new grace. How am I going to respond to it? So I think that's a new year, uh, you know, it, that, it, that sort of thinking became New Year's resolutions. Um, it's sort of a secularized version of that mm. uh, habit forming view. Um, but I mean, the, that's the, the medievals were, they spent a lot of time on the reformation of habits. Um, I mean, they, they even, that, that's what monasteries really were all about was the, we know that we need some sort of detox from our, from our paganism. Um, and the, the, and, and a reformation of our habits of life. And so I mean, you even call what you wear as a monk, your habit, because you're, that's what you're there for is for the reformation of your habits. So, uh, that, that's how I think calendars can be, um, even a civic calendar restart can be a blessing is it's an opportunity to stop and say, what, what habits am I in that I want to get out of and what habits should I replace them with? Three questions left. All right. Quick ones. A poem for Christmas. Ooh. Um, I really like T.S. Eliot's poem about the wise men, um, which is, so that's one I read every year uh journey of the magi okay um, t.s Eliot's journey of the t.s magi. Eliot's journey of the magi so he he's a poet he he was not a christian when he began publishing his poetry he gets saved radically saved um and his poetry takes a little bit of time to catch up but he you kind of get this poetic um you get to, you get to watch the conversion, the the long term sanctification of a man in poetry, which is great. But Journey of the Magi is beautiful. So Christmas that, poem. So I take um, that to the family. Okay, that's the only one. You only get one. You only get one. I get one. We're All gonna right. focus on one. A poem for New Year's. Um. Oh man. I mean, my go to for is always. Um, so Joffrey Swait has a book of poetry that's got public public poems for reading. Um, he's got a, a really good one in his, it's his poetry collection is called well met and it's got uh, a poem for uh, it's, it's got poems for public readings in the back and um, they're all really good. That's, that's probably where I would go um, just off the top of my head. If I was having like a new year's party and I needed a poem to read, uh, He's got okay. some good ones in there. All right. And now I'm going to revisit the question I asked you early in the beginning. Okay. Right. How does uh, astron astrology, astrology, astronomy, 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 um, work through some of the modern issues that we currently have right now that we're yeah. dealing with. So, um, a, a significant part of, the, the reason modernity has the kind of hold that it has uh, on uh, on the world is because it has captured the imagination and separated it from our day-to-day -day experience. So um, it has, um, when we try to imagine, you know, the place that we live, our, the, our place in the world, our vision of the world comes from a place outside of our own experience. So when you stop and you say, I am going to study the, uh, the movements of the moon and the, 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 the sun, right? Um, uh, there's a great book called sun, moon, and earth. Yeah. That's where I would, that's right. That's, yeah. that's where I would have, that's where I have people start. Um, it just shows you how to notice from your perspective, what the sun and the moon are doing. It's just a book. It's a small book. It's published by Wooden Books. And it's how do you learn to notice 
your the 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 movements of of the sun and the moon and its relationship to your experience and it it's it it shifts your imagination from that supposed objective perspective outside your experience uh, where you kind of sit in the balcony of the universe and watch your own life it shifts it down to how do i actually um imagine my life from my own perspective so it has a a um that kind of effect uh it all of a sudden it makes you much more difficult to manipulate much more because you're not um you're you haven't uh you, your imagination is no longer in their hands so to speak right <laughs> so i think that the that cosmological shift within the imagination of uh of the modern man is one of the reasons that atheism feels tenable at all mm. um, that that communism seems like well maybe we should give it a shot right i think all of that grows out of the um the the kind of gnosticism that comes with imagining your life from some other perspective than your own um so imagining your position from some other pos position than your own so uh, that's my, that's, that's the answer that, that, that deals with, that deals with transgenderism that deals with pretty much almost any situation, egalitarianism, it, it, all that stuff yeah. is, it has, you know, you have an anchor to fight against that stuff. You're more anchored to fight against that stuff when you understand the kind of world that God made. Right. And those, those things, it's like the, the very forming of the beauty of those things. When you have to embrace it, you see it interrupts the rhythm. Yeah, the God has designed that feeling that we've been dislodged from reality. Right, is is the reason we're susceptible to a lot of those these promises because the promise is let me I, I will re, I will re uh, insert you into reality. It's some it's somebody else's fault that you have been dislodged from reality, and I will force them. To, to stop doing to you what it is that they're doing, right? All of those sorts of promises that are made, they begin with that the, we're susceptible to them because we feel dislodged from reality. Um, astronomy has an anchoring effect, right? It, it's like tying, it's tie, it ties, it. Like it did in Genesis. Your feet. Like yeah, it, it pushes it. your feet back into the dirt. Right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is a, the this is even not even getting into you know, kind of metaphorical systems that we use for description or anything this is just learning to look up and and notice oh this is what's where the moon is in its cycle this is where the sun uh is in its in its yearly movements this you know, learning to learning to notice those sorts of things um has an incredibly uh anchoring effect.